Hey guys, it's Mr. Candy back with a, another video on evolution. So this one is going to be talking about evolution of populations. Now, you see the quote down here at the bottom. It says, individuals are selected, but populations evolve. I just want to keep hitting into your skull that individuals do not have the ability to evolve themselves. Populations evolve, not individuals. Now, when we talk about population genetics, there's four or five terms we need to know. You need to know what a population is. It's a group of individuals of the same species that live together. A species is a group of populations that interbreed with one another. A gene pool is like the total aggregate of all the genes and all the alleles that are found in that population. And population genetics is, of course, the study of genetic change in populations. Whenever we talk about um, population genetics, we have to talk about the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, which basically serves as a model for genetic structure of non-evolving population. Now, non-evolving is important. Because what that means is that evolution is not occurring in a, in a population that you can use the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So there has to be like five criteria that you meet. You can, it has to have a very large population size, so there's no genetic drift occurring. There can be no migration, so there's no gene flow. There can be no mutations. There, can be, there has to be random mating occurring, and there can be no natural selection in order for this to actually work. Now, when we look at the Hardy-Weinberg principle, it was, it was invented by Hardy and Weinberg, which are which are a mathematician and a, a phys, mm, and a physician. And basically, the the principle, the theorem is down here at the bottom. It is p squared plus two p q plus q squared equals one, where p equals an allele, maybe a dominant allele. Q equals an allele, maybe a recessive allele and it's going to equal 1, so you can figure out the frequency. Now let me give you an example. If we had a population of 100 cats, and 84 of them were black, and 16 of them were white, we wouldn't really know what percentage were big bees and what percentage were little bees, but we could work out the problem. We could work out the problem by doing this. If we said that Q was the recessive allele, then we'd have 16 out of 100 cats are white, so we know that little b occurs 0.16 times, I mean, excuse me, Q squared would be 0.16. Now to find Q, we simply take the square root of 0.16, so little b occurs 0.4 times. And to find big B, we simply subtract that from 1. So that gives us what, um, how, what percentage of each allele. So little b is going to occur 40% of the time, and big B is going to occur 60% of the time in the population. So this has to assume, though, make sure you understand that it has to make it has to make all the assumptions that those five things I mentioned a while ago are not occurring. Okay, and there's our totals. We have p squared is 0.36, pq 2pq is 0.48, and q squared is 0.16. So 48 percent. So I could tell you that um, 48 of those 84 black cats were actually heterozygous. All right, now, there are five agents of evolutionary change, and these are the five things that could not be occurring for the Hardy-Weinberg theorem to be true. So the next thing is genetic drift. It's a change in the gene pool of a population over a succession of generations. Genetic drift can only happen to a uh, small population that happens by chance. My, my best example is this. If you had a mud puddle, and you had tadpoles in the mud puddle, and somebody came by and riding the four wheel and splashed out the tadpoles, you know, that's going to change the gene pool dramatically because you have a very small population. But if you have a hurricane come through North Carolina, now that's not going to affect the gene pool of the human population uh, as a whole because you're only talking about a very small amount. Now, another example of genetic drift would be like called the bottleneck effect. And the bottleneck effect is caused by, for some reason, you have a reduction in the population, maybe through a natural disaster, a hurricane, a flood, a fire, in which the survivors are not really a true representation of the entire population as a whole. All right, that's bottleneck effect. And you can see it over here to, to the right. You have in this original population, you have, you have some white ones, you have some yellow ones, you have some blue ones. But when you do go through the bottleneck, something occurred where the surviving population only has blue and white. And actually has more blue than white. So the ratio is not the same. So something occurred to make it kind of skewed. All right. Now, whenever we talk about the bottleneck effect, conservationists really have to think about this. So if you have an endangered species, you have to really think about crossing it with other species from another zoo or from another area so that you don't create this bottleneck 
uh, effect. So, you know, that's important when we're talking about breeding programs. Now, there's another thing called the founder effect, and you can even think of the founder effect dealing with pilgrims that came to the New World, in that, you know, that small percentage of human beings that came over and, and landed on Plymouth Rock were not necessarily a representation of the entire gene pool back in England. So that is what we would call the founder effect, is which when you have a colonization of a new area, and the alleles of that new colony might be different from the gene pool as a whole. Now, the next thing is gene flow. Gene flow is simply happens when animals migrate in and out of the population, and they carry the alleles with them or not. Now, I'd like this picture to the right. This was done by Time Magazine a few years ago, in which they took all the allele possibilities of all the people that have immigrated into the United States, and this person here is a combination of all those alleles. So this is called the New Face of America, what a computer-generated form of what a person might look like. Uh, another key factor to microevolution is mutations. And mutations create variation in the populations. And I want you to make sure you understand that mutations are not always bad things. A lot of times mutations are good things. So it just makes sure that we continue to have variety. Um, the next one is non-random mating. There's a reason why certain organisms select other organisms. There's a sexual selection going on. Now, we can have other things like inbreeding, which you know make close to the related species or organisms, or assorted mating. You know, they can shift the frequency from one side to the next. Now, when you talk about sexual selection, a lot of times organisms are selected sexually based on physical characteristics, such as lions with a huge mane or peacocks with the most beautiful feathers. Every which guy has uh, the, the, the most attractive features to the female is the one who gets to procreate. Now the last one is natural selection, and this is just simply differential, differential success in reproduction. You know, it's going to be determined by the environment and what happens, like climate change, the availability of food, predator prey, toxins, you know, it's a combination of alleles that provide fitness increase in the population. So, for example, the pepper moths. The pepper moths at one time, there were, there were a higher percentage of white pepper moths than there were black pepper moths because the bark was predominantly white colored. After the Industrial Revolution, the bark of the trees in which the pepper moths lived became dark. So the allele frequency shifted in which now you have a higher, variety, higher number of black pepper moths than you do white pepper moths. Now, when we talk about natural selection, you know, there, there is a selection acts as any traits that affect survival, such as, you know, predation, physiology, sexual selection, etc. Um, now, when we talk about variation, variation is the raw material of natural selection. Without it, it will not occur. We've got to have variation or a break in the equilibrium for evolution to a even start. Now, where does variation come from? Variation comes from mutations such as changes in the DNA through either an error in mitosis or meiosis, maybe an environmental damage. It can come through sex, in which you have a mixing of the alleles through recombination. Um, you know, any of these could be a variety of ways in which you can add variation to a community. Now, when we talk about population variety, often you'll hear the word called polymorphism. Poly means many. Morphism means there's going to be more than, more than two different types occurring, like these butterflies over here. They're, they could be the same species, but they have different colorations, or they have different morphs, for example. And it could also be geographic variation in which the same organism, depending on where it's found geographically, might look differently. Like if, it, if a squirrel lives on one side of the, of the canyon and opposed to another side of the canyon, it might be darker in color. Um, the last thing is variation preservation. Why would you have this variation be preserved in a population where there's a thing called heterozygous advantage. I really want to focus in on this one. It's number one right here. And why this man reported would be like in sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is predominantly found in from um, Africa in which if you have sickle cell you're immune to malaria. Now if you are if you have homozygous sickle cell then you run a danger of having a lot of blood clots and other things. If you do not have sickle cell at all, your homozygous normal, I guess, then you are more susceptible to malaria. But if you are a heterozygote, you actually have some characteristics of sickle cell which enough to make you 
not necessarily immune to malaria, but have a less effective malaria. So it's actually favorable to be heterozygous. That is called the heterozygote advantage, because it's more favorable to be heterozygous than these either one of the homozygote individuals. All right, the last thing is natural selection. Natural selection, there's basically three types I want to mention real quick, and that's directional, um, diversifying, and stabilizing. We might have called diversifying disruptive in biology. All right, and, and here they are here. Directional is when you have the bell-shaped curve shift to one end or another, such as like in giraffe necks. Over time, they get longer and longer and longer. Uh, stabilizing is when the average individual is selected. Maybe human birth weight would be one. And disruptive, which is what I told you, is when they split, and it's both ends are affected. Now, let me explain this just a little bit. Let's say we have small, medium, and large. Directional, if we had something eating all the small ones and eating all the medium ones, but the large ones were surviving, that would be directional. So there would be more large ones over time. Stabilizing, we have more of them eating the small ones and the large ones. We have more medium ones in the population. And disruptive is the ones that something's eating the medium ones and the large and small are surviving. All right. The last thing is sexual selection. There's sexual dimorphism, which means that there's a difference between sexes. Males and females are different, especially in the animal kingdom. Oftentimes, the males in the animal kingdom are, are the brighter colored ones because they have to attract females. And they can attract the female, um, they're able to procreate. All right, I hope this helps you a little bit on evolution of populations, and I will talk to you soon.